Good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Simonson, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Victorian Healthcare Association. For those of you that don't know, the VHA is the peak body for our public hospitals and community health services and aged care and a range of other organisations across uh, Victoria. And we support those services to advocate uh, for the needs of their organisations, but more importantly, for their communities and the healthcare needs of the Victorian community as a whole. Thank you for joining us for this uh, special event, Equality and Health in a Changing Climate. Uh, I'll quickly take you through some housekeeping before introducing our MC and facilitator for today, uh, and uh, uh, that's Dr. Sue Matthews, and she will lead the panel um, discussion and the presentations. We are recording this session, and the recording will be available on the VHA website for anyone who is unable to attend today, and we'd encourage those of you who are attending to share that with your colleagues, people who weren't able to attend, um, so that they can get the benefit of the session as well. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to submit questions for our speakers. Uh, each speaker will present and then there'll be time at the end for uh, Q&A for those questions get answered and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. So uh, our host today is Dr. Sue Matthews, who is um, not only the chair of the VHA board, um, she is the CEO of the Royal Women's Hospital and she will be very well known, I'm sure, to many of you here today. Sue's an experienced health service leader with more than 20 years of senior operational and strategic leadership in hospitals, um, in community care and in government, both here and in Canada. She sits on a number of boards and advisory committees, as well as the VHA board. She is on the Victorian Family Violence Steering Committee, the Victorian Clinical Council, um, the Women's Health Activist Movement Global, and is, uh, of course, our chair. And we're very uh, proud to have her and very happy to have her here today leading this event for us. So. Um, uh, I, I would also, um, before we start, I would acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands that we are all uh, participating in this event from today. Uh, for me, that is the Jajawarung people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my particular respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, and with that, I would hand over to Sue uh, to lead the rest of this event. Thank you, Tom. Uh, warm welcome to everyone joining online today. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today. For me, that's the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nations, and I would pay my respect to their elders past and present, as well as to any elders and community members from any other areas who may be online with us today. Uh, I am delighted to welcome our guest panelists, Dr. Angie Bone, Fiona Armstrong, and Deborah, Dr. Deborah Parkinson, uh, as we consider intersection of gender equality and climate change in the context of health, a uh, topic very close to my heart. So we thank you for taking the time to join us to discuss this really important topic. Um, just a bit of context setting, climate change and gender inequality are represent two of the biggest threats to global health of the 21st century. And the direct and indirect impacts of climate change affect our most vulnerable communities. And you only have to look around us in Australia and anywhere else to see that. Physical harm, psychological distress are caused by extreme weather events, place additional pressure on Victorian people and families. And that leads to an increase in demand for health services and for social supports. We also know that some climate related health impacts disproportionately affect women. For example, mortality from heat waves is higher in women, and research suggests that violence against women increases and intensifies after bushfires and other disasters, and we certainly see that at the women's. Pregnant women and newborns are also increasingly becoming recognized as vulnerable populations in the context of climate change. The harmful impacts of climate change on the social determinants of health also risk entrenching social and economic inequality which in turn increases adverse health outcomes. And it's critical therefore that we apply a gender equality lens to the health system's preparation and response to climate change. And our panelists are gonna provide insights into gender equality and climate change from a national and Victorian perspective, as well as looking at the impacts of specific natural disasters on women and children. Our first speaker, Fiona Armstrong, 
Fiona is the founder and executive director of Climate and Health Alliance, or CAHA, I think is, is how you say it, whose mission is to build a powerful health sector movement for climate action. Fiona is the lead author of most of CAHA's publications from 2010 to 2020. She has conceived of and led many of CAHA's projects, uh, including the architect of the world's first framework for a national strategy on climate, health and well-being for Australia in 2017 and the 2021 Rewrite the Future Roundtable series, which led to the publication Australia in 2030, Possible Alternative Futures and the accompanying Healthy, Regenerative and Just Policy Agenda. Fiona is also lead author of the Queensland Government's Human Health and Wellbeing Climate Change Adaptation Plan 2018. She was named one of Australia's 100 Women of Influence in 2016 and is a recipient of the coveted Tony McMichael Award for Leadership on Health and the Environment in 2017 and the Frank Fisher Award in 2018. Fiona, thank you so much for giving us your time today and I will now hand over to you. Thank you, Sue, and thank you so much, VHA, for bringing attention to this issue. Um, what a wonderful opportunity that we have for a whole year, really, with the International Women's Day theme, Changing Climates Equality Today for a, um, a Sustainable Tomorrow. Um, I'd like to also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am the Wurundjeri people, and to say that at Climate and Health Alliance, we recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work, and acknowledge that sovereignty of the land that we call Australia has never been ceded. And we commit to listening to and learning from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and groups about how we can better reflect Indigenous ways of being and knowing in our work. Um, so I'm just going to touch on today um, a little bit about some of the work that we're leading at Climate and Health Alliance and um, the pieces of it that are relevant to this conversation um, and end with some um, suggestions about how we tackle some of these issues. Um, it's always good to talk about solutions. Um, so um, Sue kindly shared our mission um, to build a powerful health sector movement for climate action and the way that we go about that is to build capacity for leadership among health professionals and health organisations to communicate climate health impacts and solutions to increase recognition of those links, uh, to influence decision makers through advocacy and policy guidance, and to support the healthcare sector to be climate resilient and sustainable. So um, when it comes to climate change, we've had some pretty bad news lately. I mean, we've had just the most comprehensive report ever produced for, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in a report known as AR6, their sixth assessment report. Um, and their, their report from Working Group 2 on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability came out recently. Um, and the IPCC chair, Ho Si Ling, said um, in one of the many quotes taken from the report that this report shows that climate change is a grave and mounting threat to our well-being and a healthy planet. And I think we understand that very well here in Australia um, and increasingly within the healthcare sector, there's an emerging understanding about what the risks are from climate change to the delivery of healthcare, to the safety and quality of care, to risks to healthcare infrastructure and to workforce. And of course, to the populations that we serve and, um, and the populations that are at greater risk um, include women and um, in our uh, recent healthy, regenerative and just policy framework, we draw attention to that, um, you know, saying women are disproportionately impacted by climate change. And that's because of long-standing cultural, social and economic gender inequalities, which are exacerbated by climate change hazards. And um, I was just reflecting in, um, in, in preparing for this about some of the images that we see from the climate related hazards that we're experiencing at the moment. And I think most prominent in a lot of our minds is the um, floods in Northern New South Wales and the absolutely horrific experience that that community has had with, with floods um, destroying many homes. And the images that come out of that, I mean, there's, there's a PhD in it, but there's many images of men, you know, shoveling dirt and, 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 and man, you know, hauling sandbags and cleaning up and so on. Um, but I, I, I think that, um, 
you know, the role of women uh, as it is um, generally uh, often overlooked and invisible. And I've been interested to hear um, Damon Gamow say on a couple of occasions recently, the filmmaker Damon Gamow, who's uh, who lives in the Northern Rivers. So he's uh, launching a film at the moment called Regenerating Australia, which is doing the rounds of the country. Uh, so he's left his home, um, which is in, in inhabited by people who are seeking refuge from their own homes and the floods in northern New South Wales to tell this story about hope and about what we could do in terms of transforming our country. Um, but one of the stories that he tells about the experience of the floods is that, of course, as we know, when disasters happen, all communities rally together together. Um, but it's the women, he said, who are leading the coordination of that effort for women, largely with satellite phones, whiteboards in their houses, and people are coming to or makeshift shelters or wherever people are coming to them um, for the direction. And that's been um, a, a really strong kind of feature. And I was reading some of the media also um, of the stories of, of some of those women. If you dig, you can find it. Um, and the headline associated with that by saying is says, we realized help wasn't coming, so we did it ourselves. So there's some very moving stories of you know women who um, own horses, who've supported vets to rescue thousands of other horses and cattle, and um, you know, people who are ordinarily mindfulness therapists who suddenly become volunteer coordinators who are raising hundreds of thousands of dollars and negotiating with Elon Musk to provide them with um, with satellite equipment so that they can support communications. So um, it was good to see that in the latest IPCC report, just going back to that scientific report, that for the first time there was the greatest proportion of women authors. I think it was around 30 percent. I mean, not enough, of course, but um, but more than there has been. And I think the, the 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 prominence of women and the involvement of women in that scientific report has led to um, and a, a greater expression and 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 um, and and focus on the issues. Of of gender, um, some of the things that have come through from the summary of policymakers is really highlighting that in how individual livelihoods are being affected by climate change through impacts on agricultural productivity, destruction of homes, and that those adverse effects of, of gender, um, they express there's a very high confidence of, of scientific evidence around that, that vulnerability at different social, spatial scales is exacerbated by inequity linked to gender that there's very high confidence about the evidence that sits behind that. They're also pointing to solutions, however, and solutions that we have available to us that exist to address that in that social safety nets that support strong climate change adaptation um, can have co you know, strong co-benefits with other goals such as gender inclusion, you know, poverty alleviation and so on, that there's a high confidence about the evidence that sits behind that. And that structural vulnerabilities can be reduced by carefully designed policy and process interventions that address inequities based on gender. And um, it's rare for, for them to express a very high confidence, but there's a very high confidence expressed around that. Um, so that's some of the things that we that we need to move towards um, addressing those structural um, inequities through um, you know process structures and policy and so on. So in the um, healthy regenerative and just policy framework that we've we've recently developed, we've tried to draw attention to the fact um, that climate change disadvantages just disadvantages women disproportionately more than men. Um, that COVID-19 has resulted in women's gender roles becoming more entrenched, quite the opposite of what we hoped, you know, through the pandemic, that this might be an opportunity to address that. Um, that climate change impacts are amplified in Indigenous women among those who are culturally and lingu linguistically diverse, women who have disabilities, older women and women with children. Um, but again, pointing to some of the structural frameworks that we have to draw on to bring about change and the gender action plan that was agreed at the 25th United Nations climate change talks, really highlighting that we have to take a gendered um, dimension of climate change into account when we're developing policy. 
So that's something that we've tried to draw out in our um, healthy, regenerative and just framework, and um, particularly under the area of policy action about supporting healthy and resilient communities, that we need to recognise the relationship between climate change and social and cultural and economic determinants of health like gender. And we need to make sure that our health and community services have access and information to data so that they have an understanding about those impacts and the costs associated with, with that um, so that they can take action. So um, just to kind of move towards finishing, I want to um, just say that of the 90 plus groups that now form the Climate and Health Alliance, I'm really pleased to say that we really have a strong representation of organisations that are focused on women's health, uh, Women's Health East, Women's Healthcare Australasia, Women's Health in the North, Women's Health Goulburn Northeast, Australian Women's Health Network, Australian Lesbian Medical Association, the Australian Medical Federation of Medical Women, all of them helping to bring this onto the agenda and, and in influencing the, um, the way in which we frame some of our advocacy um, for policy. So, you know, I'll just return to the, you know, the, the problem, the crisis that we are facing, climate change, and, and, and share with you some of the words from Antonio Guterres, that, and because I really want to highlight the urgency of the, the issue and the urgency with which we need to tackle both of these issues, because um, each will influence the other. Um, and his words, um, Antio, Antonio Guterres saying, every fraction of a degree matters. So every, every amount that we can hold back what global warming is going to make a difference. Every voice can make a difference and every second counts. And, um, and also just reflecting on uh, um, something I saw from UN Women um, that really resonated with me, particularly at this time saying that the world needs peace and peace needs women. And I think we really intuitively understand that, but the evidence is there as well. Um, and I want to finish by saying that in order to address these structural inequities and to ensure that women are included in decision making and that gender issues are, con are considered in policy making, we need more women at the table. We need more women in our parliament. So I would, I would um, uh, just draw attention to two incredible women, um, for example, in our Australian parliament, Helen Haynes and Zali Stegall. Um, independent women um, who, without the structures and support of political parties and the budgets that accompany that, are making an incredible impact on policy and public policy conversations in Australia. So I think, um, you know, I would encourage more women to think about political leadership and political representation and look to those um, people as examples of what can be accomplished. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. That was a great you know, overview of the national context and you know, the disproportionate impacts that climate change has on women in particular. So thank you so much for that. Um, and just for everybody, the VHA team is going to publish the links to any of the resources. So Fiona will give us those and we'll post them on our website for anybody that's interested in following up. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Angie Bone. Angie is the Deputy Chief Health Officer Environment at the Department of Health. Uh, the Deputy Chief Health Officer provides expert clinical and scientific advice and leadership on environmental public health issues. I expect you've been a li little bit busy in the last couple of years. <laughs> she supports the Chief Health Officer and staff within the Health Protection Branch. And she's got extensive experience and clinical expertise in public health. She's a medical doctor with experience in health protection related to environmental hazards and infectious diseases in the UK and a number of other countries. Angie has a keen interest in the social environmental determinants of health, particularly climate change, extreme weather events, housing and urban planning, and infectious diseases. Angie is a fellow of the Faculty of Public Health in the UK, a member of the Royal College of Physicians in the UK, Associate Clinical Professor at the University of Exeter, and an Adjunct Associate Clinical Professor, professor at Monash University. And she holds numerous qualifications in public health and tropical medicine. So Angie, we thank you so much for, for you coming and sharing your experience today. So over to you. 
Great, thank you, Sue, um, and good morning, everyone, and, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. May I also first begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're all joining in from. For me, it's the Boon Wurrung, um, the lands of the Boon Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and any Aboriginal colleagues who will be with us today. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Association's real leadership and engagement in these really wicked complex but absolutely fundamental issues of climate change and health inequalities. Now I do have a few slides so I will just get those up um, now. Um, I think that they are there for us so I'll proceed. Um, so of course as, as Fiona has already outlined there's absolutely no doubt that climate and environmental conditions in which we live have a significant influence on our health and our well-being and safety and in Victoria we're already seeing the consequences of a changing climate in both direct and indirect ways and also mediated through the social determinants of health as, as we have in that that graphic that's been adapted from something from the Lancet some time ago but I still find is, is really quite useful and you have there down on the right side of the slide just some examples of, of of how our health in Victoria has been affected, you know, through the heat waves of 2009 and 2014. Excuse the me, Angie, we can't actually can't see, see your slide. slide. Oh, yeah. you can't see my slides. Thank oh. you for letting me know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me see if I can have another go at sharing that screen. Um, we know it worked, we tested it. Angie. We did, we did, and um, yeah. So that's very odd. And I've got a little line around it suggesting it's showing. So that's really oh. odd. Let me try again. Ah. Is that? Something there we go. Funny. It's coming. We, now we can see it. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for letting me know. And I apologise for that. Um, so, yes, let me continue then. So I've obviously shown you the graphic and I've started talking about the um, uh, the examples from the Victorian context of, of heat and floods and the Ross River virus um, outbreak of 2016-17 and also the bushfires of 2019-20, um, of course. And I think it would be worth just mentioning here, of course, that we now have emerging issues with Japanese encephalitis virus and, and particularly in our northeastern parts of the of the state and you know the the impact of climate at the moment is is not absolutely certain and will be there'll be a huge amount of research going into this but it seems highly likely that there's either been a change in wild bird migration or a change in mosquito you know um, uh, size or or volume of, of numbers of mosquitoes or distribution of mosquitoes that's contrib contributed to this and of course as as Fiona has so well highlighted um, women are often much more impacted by these issues for a variety of reasons that we can go into. Oops um, and you will probably all be aware of the Victorian climate science projections that the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning Commission from CSIRO some time ago I'm uh, oh, just looking sorry there we go we're on the right slide now um, so and and you can see there that um, and this won't be a surprise to anybody that sadly Victoria will continue to get hotter and drier will experience longer fire seasons have an increased severity and frequency of bushfires have an overall decrease in total rainfall contributing to longer and more severe droughts and experience a greater risk of higher intensity rainfall and storm events that are going to create higher risks of flash flooding. Now gender as we've said is one of the social determinants of health in our changing climate. As you'll all know whether someone gets ill depends partly on their physiology and their genetic makeup but it's also about the risk factors for that disease and their access to preventive health care and if they do fall ill the severity of that disease is also influenced by their health seeking behaviours um, and their access to high quality health care. And most of these factors are dictated by the wider determinants of health. And these are social and economic and environmental and commercial and cultural. And they're all interwoven with inherent factors like age and sex and gender and crucially our attitudes to them. So Marx's inequalities exist, for example, women's pay and women's status, even before we take into account the impact of a stressor as significant as climate change, which is only going to amplify these inequalities if we don't address them. 
And as I'm sure Deborah will go on to discuss, gender has a strong influence on the health impacts of crises and disasters, including those related to climate. Some of those are biological, um, such as greater vulnerability to heat or bushfire smoke, but the majority relate to gender norms, roles and responsibilities, as well as societal expectations of women's roles that determine our ability and vulnerability, our, our ability to adapt and our vulnerability to the hazards. And, and as uh, Fiona has already alluded to, COVID is a great example of, of, of you know, expectations on women for um, homeschooling, for care related work, etc. And of course, the links between disasters and domestic violence are really very well established. And I know Deborah's done research on that, and I'm sure she'll be talking about that. But it's also important to note that while there is now a growing recognition of gender based disparities in health due to climate change, our existing research generally considers gender as a binary construct, so male and female. And that conflation of gender and assigned sex can really oversimplify the health and well-being risks that gender diverse populations face. And that's also due to stigma and discrimination, home displacement and violence. And that can result, you know, that kind of blind spot that we have can really result in policies and programmes that don't reflect the diversity of individuals' needs. So as we've said, good health and well-being isn't evenly distributed across our population and across the world, and, in, and that is influenced by all of these wider determinants. And we don't just have one identity. The various layers of a person's identity can expose them to overlapping forms of discrimination and marginalisation, or conversely, in my case, privilege and advantage. Um, so not only gender but sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, disability, status and age and other factors um, all play a part and this interconnected nature of social categorizations is sometimes called intersectionality. Now you know one of the major fundamental parts of public health is about reducing health inequalities whatever their underlying causes are and that's why you know we really try very hard in public health to make sure that we're linking across all of these different perspectives and why when we're making plans and policies we try to take into account all of the other strategies that are also trying to deal with these issues to make sure that we are making the most of synergies and managing any any trade-offs so there's a list down there on the right right hand side of the slide um, uh, of various things that are also in place at the moment in Victoria. So the first one, Ending Family Violence, um, sets out to implement all of the 227 recommendations of the Royal Commission into Family Violence. That plan very clearly recognises that family violence is deeply gendered. 75% of victims are female and that of course has huge impacts on the health and well-being of survivors but also their children and there's a there's a real emphasis in that plan of the role of health services in identifying cases and supporting people by referring them to services that can help moving on to the next one of course if we want to reduce violence against women then we absolutely have to have gender equality if we're serious about that then we must we must you know, move towards gender inequality. So that plan is drawing on a whole range of different um, evidence and information internationally to, to make reforms like legislative changes, looking at governance structures, again, as, as we've already talked about, lifting women up into leadership positions um, and funding decisions. And the new Gender Equality Act, which came into force uh, last year, I believe, will see the entire public sector workforce conducting audits, gender impact assessments for new policies, developing action plans and reporting equal pay and sexual harassment and equal opportunity career progression practices really to promote gender equality and that's something the department is taking very very seriously as well. Then we have the Corin Corin Ballot Jack um, plan for Aboriginal health um, that really puts Aboriginal self-determination at the centre of everything that we do, recognising the real importance of Aboriginal people taking ownership, carriage and responsibility 
for designing, delivering and evaluating policy and services on their own terms. And um, indigenous, indigenous knowledge systems are, of course, absolutely critical to our care for country and community. And we have so much to learn in this changing climate from, from, from First Nations peoples across the world. And then lastly, I must mention Pride in Our Future, which is Victoria's very new LGBTQI plus strategy um, for 22 to 32, um, which is a whole of government strategy, really promoting safe and healthy um, communities um, and, and allowing these communities to have equal human rights in all areas of life, um, which is absolutely fundamental. Um, and of course, we recognise that there's no one size fits all for all of these things. And instead, we need to really work in, in genuine partnership with Victorian communities, tailoring our, response, our responses to their needs, um, but also amplifying their strengths. Um, I, you know, I really don't like using the deficit model. Um, for me, it's really very much about bringing out strengths and learning from each other, co-designing um, and taking place based approaches. So, oops, there, the health and human, so this is the, my, my last slide, which is really about the um, Climate Change Adaptation Action Plan. So whilst we do have our Climate Change Act, which provides a legislative foundation for reducing our emissions, and you can see the targets there, um, we know that a certain amount of climate change, even if we were to stop carbon today, going into our atmosphere, a certain amount is locked in and we are going to have to adapt. Um, and so that's why there are these, this within the, the Act, there are there is this requirement for us to produce five yearly plans um, of the key sectors and health and human services is one of those sectors. Um, the, the, the plan that we've done um, has relatively recently been produced um, and I really want to acknowledge all of the uh, engagement we've had from stakeholders to make that plan the best that it could be and also really to acknowledge the input of the VHA um, into that. And the plan does pick up some of the uh, gendered aspects of climate change adaptation referring to um, increased mortality from heat and increased male suicide rates with heat, with recognising um, the violence against women following extreme events, um, and that the disaster places pressures on people to conform to gender stereotypes that can actually exacerbate existing inequalities. So the importance of applying a gender um, lends to emergency and disaster planning and response. So you have down there on the right the actions that are in the plan. The plan, the actions that I think will probably be of most interest to the membership of VHA will probably be H1 and H11. So for H1, um, this is really about engagement and engaging the profile and leadership of health voices, health professionals who have a really influential voice in engaging with the community about how we can all stay healthy in a changing climate and also working with other sectors, recognising that most of, many of the levers that affect our health sit outside the um, portfolios of health. They're in planning, they're in water, they're in food and agriculture production, for example, the built environment. Um, and then for H11, we're really aiming to leverage this huge footprint that we have across the health sector um, to really promote climate change adaptation and risk management. Um, partnering with health and community services and so for smaller services what we really want to be able to do is to be as supportive as possible by providing training and tools um, etc to um, to promote that work and also resources to help with risk management and plan the surges in demand which are inevitable um, and then for the larger organizations we really really want to push them um, to, um, to take more active responses, actually require them to take responses in relation to risks um, from climate change. So that is really the end of my presentation. I just wanted to show you that at the end, we've got a list of key resources and I'm happy to share those slides later on, but I'd wrap up by really saying the health sector has a critical role in re both reducing emissions and supporting the community to adapt. And the only way we are going to be effective at doing this is by taking a gender and LGBTQIA plus lens. So thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Andy and Angie. And like before, we'll post these so that people have access to them, which is great. Um, and that's, you know, the Victorian context and the Victorian government's approach to the climate change um, and the new action plan, which is great to see. So we'll, we'll post that for everyone. Um, and thank you again, Angie. Uh, our third speaker, Dr. Deborah Parkinson. Deborah is the Director of Gender and Disaster Australia and an Adjunct Research Fellow at Monash University. Uh, her work since 2009 has focused on gendered experiences of disasters. In 2015, Deborah was awarded the Social and Political Sciences Graduate Research Thesis Award for her PhD on domestic violence after the Black Saturday bushfires. Over the past two decades, she's researched intimate partner violence and rape, women's unequal access to the legal system, and gendered discrimination through the superannuation system. She's presented her research in Japan, Denmark, the US, Scotland, New Zealand, as well as many Australian conferences. Um, so we really appreciate you, Deborah, taking some time out of your day today to uh, present to us. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks so much, Sue. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of where I am, which is Judge Awara country. Um, I do have a focus on women, thinking that the event was associated with International Women's Day. A lot of our work is actually with LGBTIQA plus people. But what's really interesting is that the binary is really central because of what, what you mentioned, Angie, about those really stringent gendered expectations. So I'm going to highlight three critical time points, recognising that climate change is the cause of more frequent disasters like fires and floods, and has been linked, linked as well to the COVID pandemic. It's 2018 and domestic violence in disasters is documented across the globe. In countries as diverse as Iran, Pakistan, Japan and Australia, DV increased in disasters and there were commonalities across the world of women's sacrifice, victim blaming and excusing men's violence. Triggers, though not causes of DV, were identified. In disasters, there's a litany, unsafe, insecure housing, substance abuse, stress, trauma, grief and loss, relationship problems, unemployment, economic pressures, complex bureaucratic processes, particularly in regard to grants and insurance, reduced informal and formal supports, restricted movement and transport, a changed community and a different life course. Less identified as an explanation for DV in disasters is the role of patriarchy and male privilege in allowing violence against women and children. At worker level too, how service providers perceive DV before an event predicts their recognition and response. Cultural acceptance of DV condemns women. The Bangladesh study found 86% of mothers had been abused by their husbands during a flood. Pakistani researcher Palaksha Mamon interviewed women in the flood prone areas of Sindh in 2020 and writes, what came out as astonishing was a majority of women's acceptance of this violence. One respondent said, have nowhere to go. Besides, if he will not take his frustration out on me, then on whom? I am his wife. I have to bear it. After Black Saturday, women's sacrifice was also expected. A worker told us, not saying anything about DV is not the thing to do, but maybe people understood why it was happening and maybe that's why they didn't do anything. One respondent told us, after the fires, he was taking it out on the person that he could and I was a strong one and I kept thinking, better me than the kids. Australian Anrose research indicated that too many Australians are willing to excuse violence as part of a normal gender dynamic and one in five believe DV is a normal reaction to stress. In this context, it was heartening to read recommendation 22.5 from the federal government's 2020 Royal Commission into the Disaster Arrangements to develop nationally consistent recovery programs, including DV. This was followed by the announcement three months ago of funding to extend the GADPODS training across Australia. Time point two, it's the 6th of January, 2020. It's the height of the Black Summer fires. Australians witnessed horrific images of the coastline on fire and thousands of people displaced by the most devastating fires recorded 
in the world, according to the Australian Academy of Science. ANU reported 14% of Australians were directly affected and 75% indirectly. Without funding, we worked hard and fast to ensure our resources and training were available. We wanted to disrupt the trajectory we know too well from the resource, sorry, from the research of suffering men and TV. It was critical communities and firefighters knew heroic masculinity was unrealistic. They had not failed as men because they felt they failed as protector and provider. We wanted women, recovery workers and communities to explicitly understand the ways women are co-opted into accepting violence from their partners after disasters. A decade ago, our Black Saturday research documented the systemic silencing of women to prioritise men and community cohesion. We designed postcards called Disaster is no excuse for family violence to challenge this. First printed in 2012, they're still in print with thousands distributed and now in 10 languages. Right now, we're distributing postcards and gem guidelines into flood affected Queensland and New South Wales after requests for them. The postcard gives four simple steps to use to let women know we're willing to hear because women do not easily speak of the violence against them. In disaster, there's enormous pressure not to speak of it. It comes from family members, friends, police, and even health professionals. The urgency of disaster response, the valorization of men's heroism, and the complexity of post-disaster trauma compromise safety. Overlapping this disaster is another, COVID. With COVID, there's a greater willingness to address the increase in DV because we're not talking about firefighters and the pillars of our community. Try a Google search of DV and COVID compared to DV and bushfires. Yet in both disasters, actual reports of DV decreased. DV experts report victims being unable to call safely while compelled to stay at home with their abuser or because they didn't want their kids to hear. Calling triple O won't bring peace so women appeased perpetrators until they could find a way out. Australian research found that 25% of disaster survivors have serious mental health issues. The 2020 survivors were affected even more harshly as the COVID response shut down many supports previously available. The tyranny of the urgent can lead to regressive change. Early in 2020, there were already incursions into women's rights in the name of coronavirus. There were contraceptive supply shortages, attempts to curtail abortion in the US, ceasing monitoring of the gender pay gap in the UK, and in Australia, rushing through changes to workers' rights. Time point three, it's now 2022. How are women faring in Australia more than two years into a pandemic on top of the worst bushfires in recorded history? Some stats. In regional areas, a staggering 41% of women had to ask for financial help from friends or family in the previous year. 80% of one-parent families are headed by women. One third of single women over 60 live in permanent income poverty. Older women are a fast growing group in the homeless population, increasing by 31% from 2011 to 16. Our 2016 research, Living Longer and Less, revealed the closer women subscribe to the feminine script, the worse their circumstances. The expectation that women are primary carers with children and parents results in fewer hours of employment, career breaks for childbearing and raising and lower superannuation balances, 20% lower than for men. Both income and super for women will decrease further as childcare and education infrastructure is often destroyed, destroyed in disasters, exponentially increasing the care burdens on women and fracturing careers. Think home slowly. Consider too that in the first months of COVID, women lost more jobs than men, 8% compared to 4%. Many were forced into casual work. In May to November 2020, 60% of new jobs were casual and women filled 62% of those. JobKeeper excluded short-term casuals. Most were women. Gender discrimination was an early feature of disaster recovery funding. 
More funds went to the male-dominated sectors of construction and energy than all the other sectors combined, including hospitality. Women are less likely to afford housing that's protected from the direct effects of climate change, for example, insulation, air conditioners, solar panels, or safe from the effects of flooding, cyclones, and bushfires. Mould from flooding or smoke or asbestos in bushfires also pose health risks, including to babies and children. Through economic inequality, women are more likely to live in higher risk areas where housing is cheaper to buy and rent, such as fire and flood zones. Insurance there is increasingly unaffordable, so one disaster can financially destroy lives. After disaster, women are less likely to regain housing, especially as rental options are reduced and the cost soars. Rising food prices caused by climate change will hit women hardest. 27% compared to 18% of men experienced food security in 2019. These women were likely to have experienced DV and to have raised children alone. DV is a documented characteristic of post-disaster recovery the world over. It has its roots in the everyday. Disasters don't exist in isolation from the social and cultural constructs that discriminate against women. In conclusion, as healthcare professionals, you can help for, for suggestions. Be open to hearing women speak of DV and respond. You can use a postcard, ask, name it, give referral numbers, check in next time. Two, stop expecting men to protect the home and provide no matter what. And stop expecting women to sacrifice their health and well-being. Identify these as outdated notions that put people's lives at risk. Three, let men be vulnerable and give referral numbers. And four, ensure women and children's right to live free from violence is unconditional, even after disasters. Thank you. Deborah, thank you. That was great. And it was it was a bit muffled, I gather, but um, we're going to put up a transcript of it. So for a few people missed a, a little bit of it. So but but thank you for that. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. So I've got a couple in the Q&A and a couple in the chat and I'll try and sort of um, master them all. Um, the first question is, I would be interested in your views on the corporate healthcare sector and what their contributions are to equity and climate change. Um, who wants to start that one? Maybe Angie, can I pass that one to you? You can if you can explain to me what we mean by corporate, and that might just be my Brit's um, perspective, not really understanding. Is that, Are we talking about private or public or all? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, perhaps I'll just talk generally then, yeah. just about the healthcare sector. Um, I think the healthcare sector has a huge role in in both of Andy, those. The the person has responded private. So private. Just, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's really helpful. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Um, yeah. Now, I I I think let's let's focus then on the private health sector. I think that the private sector, in some ways, perhaps has more latitude um, to do to be creative and innovative when it's not constrained by kind of government. Um, that are sometimes lagging, I'll be honest, policies and procedures. So I think that there is real scope for real innovation um, in those areas and to be a leader. Now, I don't know a lot, but I understand Mercy Private is one of those real leaders within Victoria um, uh, around that. And then I guess the other kind of element of private, if you like, is about supply chains, um, particularly from a, a, well, both an environmental sustainability carbon reduction side of things um, in many making sure that everything is as low carbon as possible, but also in terms of supply chains and resilience. Um, I, that may be a, you know, I probably need to think about that a little bit more, but those would be my immediate, immediate thoughts, at least from the climate perspective. And, and on the supply chain, uh, you know, the footprint, carbon footprint from hospitals during COVID has just exploded because of all of the PPE you know we saw we saw visions of the world and the emissions that shrunk when you know became much less when people were locked down and not not driving anywhere etc uh, but I would I would suggest that the, the um, it's offset in many ways by uh, what's happened because of the use of PPE yeah, yeah. if I can add to that um, people might have seen the Ellie bird in Lismore with the floods so in 2017, she led the Helping Hands group 
Um, she's back working. She's constantly on the television. Uh, she invited me to go there in 2019, two years after the flood there. And two years after, that big pool of volunteers had shrunk down to a handful of women. And I said to them, are you paid for any of this work? And they laughed. Um, so I think corporate Australia could help. It's dead easy to identify those community leaders and to provide them with not just post-disaster support, but ongoing between the disasters. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Well, the next question is a uh, fabulous presentation, everyone. It's the first thing they've said. Thanks. Uh, given our current environmental challenges and the economic after effects of the pandemic, domestic violence is likely to increase in the coming years. What sort of prevention and proactive strategies should we be investing in in anticipation of this? Is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Um, Respect Victoria is the Victorian organisation focused on uh, primary prevention of family violence, but uh, not that. And I think that our work is very much about prevention. It's about saying these constructs, we have stringent gender stereotypes, a man has to be like this, and that a woman has to be like this, protect, provide, sacrifice. That's at the heart of violence. You overlay that, that with a feeling of failure in men, uh, really limited options for women and domestic violence is the result for far too many people. Thanks, Deborah. Next question is, do the panelists think that Victoria is prepared to respond to its next climate disaster from a health perspective? And can it do so in a way that encourages gender equality? And if not, what should we be doing? Um, Angie, I think you were going to jump in on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm happy to start at least. I mean, I, I think we learn from each disaster, each crisis um, where we could ha where we've done OK and where we could have done better. And I think, you know, things like the Bush, the Royal Commission on the Bushfires has certainly pointed to things like improving the way we were doing air quality messaging, for example. And there's a whole host of things that have come out of the COVID pandemic response, well, preparation and response, which is now generating a lot of uh, a lot of effort to to learn those lessons, to be ready for the next one. And I think my, my perspective is that I think um, much of what we have learned through COVID we can apply, but there are some aspects that we we still need to to address if we're thinking about other hazards relating to water quality or food safety or, or whatever that the may be that may be harder i think i think we still have quite a lot of work to do to really have a genuine equity gender equity lens through this i think we're starting that journey by starting to talk about this but whether or not it's really embedded in practice i'm not sure I, as i've been you know and i'm learning all the time as well as i've been listening to this conversation I've been thinking about you know whether in the next instant management team that I run that I actually think I should have somebody on that team who is dedicated to making sure that we're focusing on equity and and making sure that our responses are supporting the most vulnerable we kind of assume it's happening and in the in the heat of the moment it sometimes gets forgotten so, you know, I've learned through this discussion today that that's actually something that I will do to change my practice. Thanks, Angie. Uh, a couple more. Uh, unless health services have adequate funding and infrastructure for our current health care provision, it will be almost impossible to adapt or respond to climate related surges or disasters or indeed incremental climate impacts in a sustainable way. So this was a plea for better funding. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's the national perspective on the funding, but there's also the state perspective. Do anybody want to comment on that or leave it as a, <laughs> as a comment? Um, I'm happy to jump in. I think um, we're extremely, I live in Victoria, we're extremely fortunate to have, I was just remarking to Angie in the chat, the confluence of policy and political leadership that really allows for some very thoughtful policy development around complex issues like climate change and gender inequality. I would say, though, in terms of our um, preparation and management of risk and, um, and support for health services going forward, that all governments in Australia and probably around the world have failed to invest in the kind of 
preparation climate risk assessment that has allowed the, the preparedness that climate change impacts demand. I mean, we're, we're moving in the right direction and it's really heartening to see this great leadership in Victoria. I would, and, and, um, and I would say, you know, that issue of funding is something that comes up over and over again when we were doing a, a consultation in Queensland ahead of developing the Queensland Climate and Health Adaptation Plan. It was, you know, absolutely the thing that people bring to the table you know we need money to adapt we need money to do this work but i would really encourage health executives and health service managers to be thinking about where the savings can be made i mean there's a lot that can be done as we mitigate climate change in terms of savings that arise from energy efficiency gains and then there's also the kind of opportunities through models of care you know do we always need to be delivering that care or that health service and um you know if we're serious about investing upstream and in health promotion and primary prevention um you know let's invest to realize those savings so that the um the funds that we need for climate adaptation and mitigation are available to us because we're not delivering unnecessary care and, and i would add you know, funding models, we have a preoccupation with acute care, <laughs> you know, funding should be going to community services because they're the upstream, you know, acute care should be there as the safety net, they shouldn't be there as the, you know, everything to everyone. So I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done in that for the, for the funding models. Uh, okay, next one. I'm planning on devoting the month of June to child safety and family violence awareness and to introduce family violence officers. This is probably Deborah. Um, what advice would you give me to include in my awareness month? Yeah, fantastic. Um, we did some research. We were commissioned by Respect Victoria on primary prevention workers within local government and other organisations. And what we found is that they were in the face of COVID, the COVID disaster, they were really quickly diverted to response and even beyond response to packing rats, rat tests, you know, to actually doing emergency response, nothing to do with family violence. So um, I would try, I think that's fantastic that the whole month is going to be devoted to that. Um, and I think pointing out involving the senior leaders who can make those kind of decisions so that they understand the importance of family violence at a time when it's going to increase. So stop diverting resources away. At uh, Gender and Disaster Australia, we have some really great resources like Snapshots. So it's not like you have to read big re research papers. It's just front and back of A4. Um, we have the postcards. We have gender and emergency management guidelines. One of those guidelines is that you include family violence uh, specialists. So if there's a community meeting about the disaster or if there's an organisational meeting about COVID, you invite in the local family violence specialists, which I think is what's planned. Um, so all of those I think would be fantastic. Thanks, Deborah. And I would, I would add um, the research study that was done by a midwife from the women's found that up to 40% of healthcare professionals have experienced family violence in their lifetime. Um, so I would want to acknowledge that and understand their experience of that as they are supporting women who, have, who are experiencing it as well. So I think that's another area. I think we, do we have time for one more? Um, I'm going to say, what levers can we use to ensure organizational leadership in climate change adaptation? It seems to be put on the back burner and not prioritized in between disasters. Can, can I just start with one quick thing? to say that um, Milton Friedman, really conservative economist of the 50s, said disasters are an opportunity for change. It can be progressive or regressive. He yep. was conservative. They used that as a way to back all the gains of marginalised groups. And you can see that happen after every disaster. So let's be alert to that. I might just add to that by saying, Sue, um, and thanks for the question, Aileen, in terms of levers on organisational leadership, I would say, um, you know, organisations, institutions need to be embedding climate change in their strategic plans. It needs to come from the top. There is a responsibility of boards to make sure that this is a priority issue. And there's emerging legal advice about the you know, fiduciary duty of, duty of directors who are on health service boards to include climate change risks um, and management in 
um, their strategic and operational plans. Um, otherwise, they, you know, because those risks are material and, um, and um, you know, uh, um, and, and, and foreseeable, um, that there is really no excuse for not including them. But I would also say there are other levers like, you know, perf national health performance standards, and we're doing some work with the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality and Healthcare at the moment. And I would hope that in the future that we would see some national health performance standards around climate change risk um, mitigation for health services um, that, that is mandatory. Yeah, and I might just add that's one of the things that we're talking about when I'm talking about the large funded organisations and agencies is our requirements on them. Um, we're still working out what that would be, but there could be, you know, significant reporting requirements, for example, to, to actually show what they're doing. Well, that is all the time that we have. I think Tom is jumping back on just to, to say thank you to everyone. So I would, you know, would like to say thank you to all of our panelists and to all of you for joining us, but I'll hand back to Tom. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. And, and thank, you, thank you to everyone for, um, for their questions, which have created a really great um, discussion at the end of the session, but, but more thank you to Sue, to Fiona, to Angie and to Deborah for um, your really insightful comments, um, such a wide variety of perspectives on this incredibly important issue. And, and thank you very much for your time. It was really important to us at the VHA that whilst a lot of coverage on International Women's Day and during the week of International Women's Day was on this thing, on the break the bias, which of course is incredibly important, we wanted to remind people that the UN chosen theme was on the impact um, of climate change on equality and, and, and on inequality. And so that was the reason for us giving a little bit of time from International Women's Day to let the, um, the, the, the coverage of, of this uh, settle um, and to run this event today. So thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you to Sue for, for chairing the session. And thank you so much to the, to the huge number of people who have attended and asked questions. You'll be able to get the recording of this online uh, very shortly after the event. I do note, and I may be uh, making assumptions based on people's first names, there's not a lot of men attending this session today so if we could share it with our male colleagues um, because I think that's one of the problems we end up with equality becoming a women's issue it's actually an everybody issue so please 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 share this uh, fantastic event with your colleagues uh, whether they be male female or uh, non-binary um, so thank you very much uh, we will have that online we'll have all the resources that have been mentioned um, and as always if you have any questions uh, or comments, please reach out to a member of the VHA team. And there's also some re resources in the chat if anything that's been mentioned today has um, created uh, any um, anxiety or triggered any feelings in you, please um, reach out for the support that has been mentioned in the chat. Uh, thank you very much all and enjoy the rest of your day and your week.